This is the Amazing Teacher Podcast with Sam Rangel, episode number six. Welcome to the Amazing Teacher Podcast, where we sit down with amazing teachers and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that you can take into your classrooms and be amazing. Now, here's your host, Sam Rangel. Welcome, amazing teachers, to the sixth episode of the Amazing Teacher Podcast. Again, my name is Sam from successintheclassroom.com. I just want to thank you for stopping by, and a special thanks to all of you who are spreading the word about the podcast on Facebook and Twitter. The stats tell me that more and more people are downloading the podcast and listening to these amazing teachers share their tips and strategies and ideas, and I'm so grateful to those of you who are telling your friends and followers about the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm so excited about this episode's guest. Her name is Chrissy Venosdale, and she was recommended to me by Pernell Rip, my first guest on the podcast, and I'm so glad that I was able to sit down with her for this podcast. Uh, Chrissy publishes an amazing blog at benspired.com, and I got to tell you, that is one blog you have to visit. Uh, in the middle of the interview, we ran into some technical issues, we lost a connection, we even had to re-record a section of the interview, and through it all, Chrissy was so understanding and patient, just so cool and so awesome. And Before the interview, I asked Chrissy if it would be okay if we talked a little bit about her daughter. I learned on her blog that her daughter is on the autism spectrum, and I thought she would be the perfect person to offer advice to teachers on how to reach students who are on the spectrum. And Chrissy was so awesome and so willing to share her unique perspective on the podcast. I know you're going to find great value in what she had to say about this and all the advice she has to share uh, with new teachers. I had a great time speaking with Chrissy, and I know you will enjoy the interview as well. So let's jump right into the interview with amazing teacher Chrissy Venosdale. Ready? Here we go. Today, I am so happy to have Chrissy Venosdale from Benspired.com on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Chrissy. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and, and let me pick your brain about school and about teaching. Um, so before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, what do you teach? Where do you teach? How did you become a teacher? And, uh, and your blog and what you're up to now? Sure. Um, well, I've been teaching for 11 years. Um, I wasn't one of those people who was like born, like wanting to be a teacher. Um, I actually wanted to be a doctor most of my life. I was always interested in science, but I always was interested in doing creative things too. And when I got to college, I kind of realized I wanted a job where I could still have my love of science, where I could still do creative things. Um, and I started volunteering in a classroom and just fell in love with it. I was like, wow, seeing these kids' excitement every day, it was just like fed me. And um, I actually switched my major halfway through. And so I did the five-year college plan where you switch majors. And I'm so glad that I did yep. because it gave me that strong science background that kind of made me the teacher that I, I feel like I can show kids how exciting science is too. Um, mm -hmm. So I taught for 11 years. I've taught in a variety of situations. I taught a fourth grade regular classroom, and then I taught in a gifted pullout program. Um, and then that kind of led me to where I am now. I'm actually um, a director at a small private school in Houston, Texas, Renard School for gifted students. And um, we have about 80, or I'm sorry, 70 students. And I'm the um, director. Uh, I I teach the teachers. And so I still get to go in the classrooms and build relationships with the kids and um, focus on technology and all things learning. Um, and it's, it's pretty exciting. Nice. Nice. And uh, your blog, tell me about the blog. Cause I, I was, I was going through your, your posts and they are just so insightful. I mean, great for, for new teachers. Uh, if you have, if you haven't uh, stopped by, eventspired.com. It's one of those blogs that you just have to uh, bookmark. Tell me about that. Well, thank you. I uh, started blogging because I just wanted like a little place to share. I, I liked making things with Photoshop. So I would make like classroom themes and share them. And it's turned into a place where I reflect and push my thinking. And the thing I love most about it is I'll read something that someone else has written 
and then it'll make me think, and then I go and blog, and it's kind of like all the blogs through Twitter are connected, and you can just constantly be reflecting and pushing yourself. So it's become more of a learning tool for me. Um, it started out as a sharing tool, and then I've realized that I've gotten so much out of sharing um, and pushing me to reflect. Um, I just share all kinds of stuff, whatever's on my mind. I find that the days mm -hmm. that I don't feel like I have anything to blog about are the days that I most need to blog. They just need to like dump my brain out and see what, you know, what's going on. I, uh, I was going through your blog and I, I uh, wrote down some quotes that I thought I'd like to get a little bit more elaboration on. Um, okay. Uh, the first one was, take some time today. Your students will thank you tomorrow. I thought that was so insightful. Talk about that one. Yeah, I think it's so easy to get caught up in just education. It's just so easy to get caught up in the stress. Um, people outside of uh, school don't realize how stressful our jobs really are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you're trying to meet the needs of lots of different types of learners and, you know, you've got educational policies and just lists, endless lists of things to take care of, um, we forget to take a moment for ourselves. My, my love is photography. And um, when I find that my camera has been sitting on my shelf too long and it's starting to get a little dust on it, I just take my camera out and go take some photos of flowers or things. And usually I end up turning those into posters later, a little hobby of mine. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I find that even taking that hour just like clears my head. It's just like the kids need. Sometimes the kids just need a break. Um, sometimes teachers just need a break. You need to just take a moment to just strip everything away and go, okay, I'm just going to take a break. And it always lets you come back more refreshed. It's, even though it feels like another thing to do to take that time, it's worth it. Right, right. And, you know, and so, so many teachers, especially now, the new teachers, they, they feel the pressure of, you know, getting through the curriculum, getting through the lesson plan. And I remember there, there were times where uh, I just got my kids and let's go outside. Let's go take a walk. Let's yeah. go, you know, uh, just hang out for five, ten minutes out in, in the quad and, and then come back. Just just that that break, that reset button to, to get things uh, working again. So I think that's... Uh, so, so true. So true. Yeah. I started I, even setting a reminder on my phone. Uh, like once a week, I'll put it, I'll put it in my calendar. This is my 20 mm -hmm. minutes that I'm just going to take a break. Um, because sometimes you need your phone to, to like remind you, Hey, go take a break. <laughs> right. 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 Um, another, another quote that I, I, uh, I read was, uh, the light may brighten the room, but it is our action that brings energy to the learning space. Yeah, I think um, I think we ultimately set the tone for learning, um, no matter our role. You know, this year, since my role has changed a little bit, I still find that when you walk into a classroom, you're, um, you kind of set the tone. If you're excited, the kids will be excited. Um, I always equate it to being kind of like a, a used car salesman. You just you go in there and no matter what it is, you let the kids know that you're excited about it. And, and it has to be real. It can't be inauthentic because the kids can sense that. Um, mm -hmm. But if, you know, if you share with them that you're curious about something, their questions are just going to flow out. And I think that that makes so much of a difference than just sitting down and going, okay, here's some work that you're going to do. Here's a project for you guys. What, what do you think about this? Whereas if you get something out and you go, look at this leaf I found, what kind of leaf is this? And um, just bring the enthusiasm every day, even on the days when you don't feel like it. Because if you bring the enthusiasm, the kids are going to bring their enthusiasm and it will end up firing you up. Um, even if you weren't fired up to begin with, if you were having one of those days, because we all have those days. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, the, the purpose of the podcast is to sit down with amazing teachers like yourself and pick your brain for strategies, practices, and ideas that new teachers can take into the classroom and be amazing. Uh, in your experience, I know that you've run across many amazing teachers uh, like yourself. Can you tell us what are some qualities that amazing teachers that you know uh, have in common? Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest things is that they're a learner right alongside their students. Um, that wasn't something that I was right away. Um, it took several years for me to really see that 
it was okay for me to be a learner along with them. And once I did, that really opened up the classroom. Um, and now I, that's my first piece of advice to everyone. Don't think you have to know everything. You don't have to be the expert. Just be a, a facilitator of learning with your students. Um, another advice, I guess I would say, is not to try to control everything in your classroom. Um, right out of college, I was just all about my rules. And I, I think back and my classroom had the rows and the kids were in desks and I would have them sit in their seats with their, their arms, you know, at a certain angle on their desk. And it was very, it almost makes me cringe now, <laughs> but it was what worked for me for that year to, to make it in my first year. And now I, I think of a classroom, kids are sitting on the floor, kids are, you know, underneath tables, if that's where they feel comfortable writing. Um, there's just so many things that don't matter that aren't about learning. And if you just right. focus on the learning and not try to control everything that happens to really empower the kids to control themselves. And I make it sound like that's easy. It's it's not, it's not easy to be like, okay, I'm going to let the kids control themselves. Because a lot of people think, oh my gosh, that would be mass chaos. Um, but it ends up being a beautiful kind of controlled chaos where the kids are on their own and they're responsible for their own learning and they, they feel mm -hmm. that energy and it just makes for a great learning environment. Right. Very good. Very good. The, uh, uh, yeah, new teachers and not all of them. I mean, I got, I got to tell you, um, new teachers are amazing. They, they bring mm -hmm. energy to, to a school and to a staff. And, and I just love hanging around with them because it's contagious that, that new, um, that new teacher, uh, energy. And, uh, but you're right. They, they, all teachers want to be in control, but yeah. let, letting go of some of that control can can make it uh, make it more exciting and make make the day go a little faster. That's the um, hardest part, I think. It's just yeah. taking that. I call it a leap of faith. I say you like it's like you're just taking that jump to be like, you know what, they can handle this. Mm -hmm. um, and once you do that a little bit, and you start to see what happens and the learning that takes off, you realize that sometimes you are the biggest thing standing in the way between them and doing something amazing. So, right. so just get out of their way. <laughs> They've got it. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, going into going into that um, class, that freedom that you give students sometimes will lead to issues with classroom management. Um, there, there's a way to to manipulate that, to control that, and to keep the classroom management from getting out of control. What advice would you give to new teachers who may be struggling with classroom management? Yeah, I know that um, that can be the hardest thing. It's you don't want your class to be out of control and unsafe. Um, one of the best things I did was switching from me making up classroom rules and posting them to actually writing norms with the kids. Um, I went through a program in Missouri called EMENTS, um, where we actually talk about getting kids to collaborate and do inquiry based learning. And a huge component of EMENTS is writing these classroom norms. And basically you write them with the students and you have a conversation with the kids. What do we need to make our classroom safe? And you'll end up having the kids write a list of about 20 things. And they always want to write negative things like no running, right. no chewing gum. And always remind them, let's write it in the terms of what would we put if we wanted a positive learning environment? So they'll say things like we should be respectful to each other. Um, and the more I did that, I realized that I didn't even need my classroom rules anymore um, because the kids were kind of empowered by the fact that they were making these these um, norms up and they would hold each other accountable. Like, hey, you're you're not being a good group member. You're supposed to you're supposed to be on task right now. Um, and you know, in the beginning, I used one of the card systems where you would change the card if you know they right. had a behavior right. like a warning. And you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with those. And I think if that works for you in the beginning to get you started, you get, you've got to do what works for your personality and your students. Um, but I just found that over time, the norms worked better for me and we didn't need those warnings anymore. I could, I could look at a kid and say, Hey, come on. And then they're like, Oh, that's right. Cause it's like right. our environment and um, they want it to be good just as much as I want it to be good. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the point you really need to reach is where it's a shared classroom. I always say on your door, you don't ever want to put like 
Miss Benazdale's classroom. You want to say our classroom because really it's not just your classroom. Really, in, in little language like that, I think sets the tone for it becoming a shared learning environment that everybody has a part in building. To create a sense of uh, that your classroom is a team, it's so important to get them building community. Um, and that's not something that just happens overnight. It has to be an ongoing um, event that you do in your classroom. Um, you, know, you can have activities as simple as, um, I call them seven minute challenges. Um, mm -hmm. you, you give kids a box of straws and a box of paper clips, and they're in a group of four and you just randomly assign teams. So kids are constantly working with different people in the classroom. Um, you know, you can have some really fun ways to put them in teams, give them a deck of cards and, you know, say, okay, match up with someone who has the same suit as you do, um, make random teams. And then they build these straw towers in seven minutes as high as they can go. That's, that's an event that brings them together as a team and doing some of those events every single week, um, really keeps them focused on how to work as a team. A lot of times people say, my kids can't work together. My kids can't collaborate. Mm -hmm. I, my kids can't handle it. Um, but they really have to be shown how and to um, have it modeled for them on a daily basis. Um, you know, if you find that your kids are arguing a lot, it could be that they need a team building event. You might say, okay, guys, we've had a lot of arguing going on. Let's stop and do some team building um, and talk about it. Um, and you know, people will say, well, I don't have time to do all this team building. I got all this stuff in the curriculum to cover. But if you can take a few minutes out of your, your week um, to do team building, it will more than make up for itself when you have those groups together and they're collaborating and things are running smoothly uh, the rest of the week. Awesome. Awesome. Um, do you have students who, because, you know, I, I taught middle school and we just have those students that no one likes. They're, they're always uh, negative and calling people names and no one wants to be on their team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you really set the tone in your classroom that everybody is going to be part of the team mm -hmm. and that you're not going to allow kind of that negativity against each other, um, certainly they can have disagreements, but um, the thing where kids will say, okay, you're partnering up, and then a kid says, I don't want to be their partner. Um, right. I just told my kids right off, like, that's not allowed. We're not going to treat each other like that. Um, and, and really picking the random team and doing that a lot in these team building activities really helps because the kids then get so focused on the task, like building their straw tower, that they forget that this may not be a person that they're best friends with, but they mm -hmm. can they can function as a team. And I always remind my kids, you're not going to be best friends with every person you work with. Just like I'm not, you know, I'm, I tell them that even as adults, you are not best friends with everyone, but you still have to be respectful and, um, and get along. And, and you as the teacher can set the tone for that. Um, you know, some kids struggle with social skills um, a lot more than others, and they want to be in charge and they want to be the boss of the group. And they just need extra guidance in, in knowing how to really handle compromising with other people. Very true. Very true. Um, you know, um, I also read on, on your blog that um, your daughter is uh, on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, well, from your perspective, um, what advice could you give teachers to better meet the needs of those students and, and how to best reach those students? Um, the first thing I would suggest is to partner with the parents. Um, I sat in on countless um, IEP meetings before I had my daughter and um, really never understood what these parents are going through. The, they just need someone to understand them. Um, you know, I, I went through a several years of, of wanting to like fix my daughter and thinking that I needed to fix something. And I came to realize that she's not broken. These kids are not broken. They just need a different perspective, a different understanding. So I would always encourage teachers to try to get into the minds and understand it from the child's perspective and to really partner with the parents because the parents are the ones that 
they've known the child since they were born and they, they hold kind of the key to understanding them. Um, and, you know, a lot of times every parent just wants what's best for their child. And that's all the teacher wants as well. So that, that partnership could be huge in understanding. Um, another thing is not being afraid to reach out to others. Um, you know, I connect with people through Twitter, um, you know, connect with someone else in your school. Don't be afraid to ask. It, it, admitting that you need help with a student is not, does not make you a bad teacher. Um, you know, when you're, when you're fresh out of college, you're made to feel like you should know everything, that you should be prepared to handle everything. And um, I can remember feeling like I needed to be the expert. And it wasn't until I realized that I'm never going to be the expert about everything, that if I just admit that, it, makes my job 110% more meaningful. Um, and you become a learner along with your students. And mm -hmm. um, those students that are so different, whether they're on the spectrum or they have another type of disability, um, those are the ones that you can learn the most from, seeing their perspective of the world. Um, just don't be afraid to reach out and try to learn from them. Wow, wow, great advice. You mentioned earlier um, before the podcast in our conversation about the difference uh, with the student with the broken arm, yeah. how you can, you can um, identify them. Tell me, tell me about, about that, the difference. Yeah, I, I think if you can see the disability with your eye, you have a tendency to just understand it. You know, if, if a child has a broken arm, you can see that broken arm and you know that you can't ask them to write with that hand, that you need to do something different. They maybe need to write with their other hand or have a computer to type with. Um, it's real easy to address those things we can see. But when it's something that we can't see, if they're wired differently, like I always say, um, my daughter is not broken, she's just wired differently. Um, you have to really understand their perspective and know how to address it. Um, like a simple example of that is she gets really overwhelmed with crowds and a school assembly was often just too much for her to handle. Um, so she would wear headphones in the assembly. Um, just little things like that can make a huge difference um, to, to a student. Just not being afraid to try to understand what you can do to make their schooling better and make their, make their learning easier for them. Right, right. Such great advice, uh, Christine. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I, I know that uh, um, teachers, even experienced teachers, like I was telling you earlier, um, when I was teaching, uh, they went to a full inclusion model. And uh, even though I had so many years of experience in the classroom, I was lost. And, and yeah. I, I didn't know how to uh, connect with, with students with disabilities. And, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have internet or blog or, yeah. or Twitter back then. So I am... Um, I'm grateful that that uh, you're you're sharing uh, your perspective um, with the audience. I, I'm, I know it's going to be very beneficial. Yeah, I'm I'm willing to share that with with anyone just to help them to see because I know from from my perspective before I had my daughter, I didn't understand it, um, and she's taught me so much. And I think, wow, as much as I've learned from her, there's students in classrooms all over the world that teachers can really learn for, from if they're just open to it. Right, and and I found that a, a lot of times the 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 modifications or the accommodations you make for students with disabilities, it's just good teaching. Yeah, it's just good teaching that that's good for all students. Um, right. So again, that's great great advice. Thank you. Uh, what is one action that new teachers can do tomorrow that will place them on the road to being amazing? Um, I think definitely get connected. Um whether it be uh, through Twitter, through setting up your own blog, through reading other people's blogs and commenting, um, or Facebook, um, connecting with people next door to you, down the hall from you, in another state, in another country, um, it just really empowers you to know that you're not alone in this, and you can collaborate with other people and share ideas. Um, every person you meet uh, has something that you can, that you can learn. And it's a matter if you meet them in person uh, or in an online environment. Um, just get connected. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, we were talking about uh, the quotes you have on your on your blog. Is there one favorite quote that uh, has inspired you as a teacher that maybe other teachers can adopt? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, W.B. Yeats, uh, education is not the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. Mm -hmm. um, because when I think about my schooling, uh, my elementary years, and it was very much about filling a pail. I was learning facts, I was doing stuff, um, you know, and, and I want my classroom at school to be the opposite of that. I want it to be about inspiring kids' passions. Um, I, I truly believe it's it's our job as educators to ignite kids' passions on a daily basis. Um, and I think that that one experience they have in your classroom with exposure to a career field or to a subject or topic they really, truly enjoy could be the catalyst that inspires them in, in their future career paths. Um, and that's pretty powerful when you think about having those moments on a daily basis. Awesome. Igniting kids' passions. Yeah. Great, great. Um, well, what is happening now in your life that you are excited about? Um, I'm most excited about my school. I'm settling in after being there for three months um, and really getting to know the kids. And um, I love just popping into classrooms and working with teachers and um, seeing things kids are excited about learning. Um, having a kid run up to me on the playground with a with a little lizard that he's caught and he's mm. showing it to me and talking about it. Um, and I'm, next week I'm heading to the um, Texas Association for Gifted and Talented conference and I'm going to be sharing about um, creating global uh, creating global learners and connecting and the power of connecting with with kids and projects. Um, and I'm going to be sharing our global garden project that we've we've started um, where the kids are going to be planting seeds and charting um, with classrooms around the world, how those seeds are growing. And, and through that project, exploring other cultures, um, Skyping, and, and just sharing the experience of growing a seed um, all around the world. Connecting the world. That's that's great stuff. Great stuff, uh, Chrissy. And congratulations on all your success that you're having um, with that. Is there is there anything else that you'd like to share with, with uh, the audience before we uh, say goodbye? Um, I would just say to share the positive message about education. Um, education has so much bad press about it, mm -hmm. and the the stories that get shared, it seems like, are the ones that aren't the really inspiring ones that we want to hear. It's it, we as teachers and and educators have to share those stories ourselves, and we can through our blogs and through our schools. Um, we can we can talk about these little moments that happen in our classroom that will inspire other people. And, you know, when I, when I started my blog, people asked me if it was, you know, called Ven Inspired because I wanted to inspire other people. And I never thought of it that way. I thought of it as I wanted to um, share about these people that were inspiring me. I'm inspired by kids when I get out of their way, what they can do. <laughs> I'm inspired mm -hmm. by other teachers who work so hard and overcome so much to do what they do in their classroom on a daily basis. Um, and and that, those are the stories that I want people to share. Um, share the good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Chrissy, it's been a pleasure getting to meet you. Hope to meet you someday in person. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know the audience will um, have a lot of takeaways from this uh, podcast in particular. So to the listeners, I know you have received a lot of great information in this episode. Now it's up to you to take it back to your classroom and implement what you learned today. So until next time. Be amazing. The Amazing Teacher Podcast is brought to you by successintheclassroom.com. Learn more about being an amazing teacher by visiting successintheclassroom.com or theamazingteacher.com.